Good morning, everyone. Looks like we've got a good crowd today. And I would like to welcome you to Emerald Ashbore University. My name is Robin Usborne, and along with Amy Stone from the Ohio State University Extension and Cliff Sadoff from Purdue University, we welcome you today to this presentation on Emerald Ashbore on the fringes of its host range. Today's presenter is the person who first discovered EAB infestations in white fringe tree, Dr. Don Cipollini. He is a professor of biological sciences at Wright State University in Dayton, Ohio, and the director of Wright State's Interdisciplinary Environmental Sciences PhD program. Dr. Cipollini's research focuses on the physiology and ecology of plant defenses to herbivores and pathogens, and the physiology, ecology, and management of invasive plants and insects. For the past 10 years, he has been part of a collaborative team to identify if ash has any mechanisms to resist emerald ash borer. Before we get started, I want to remind you that your comments and questions are welcome today. Please feel free to write them in the chat pod on the left of, left of your screen, and we will make a note of them, and Don will respond to your questions after his presentation is over to help keep the flow of the webinar smooth. Your feedback is also very important today, so please stay tuned till the end when we will be providing a link to a survey that we hope you'll fill, take the time to fill out. And for those of you needing CEUs, your survey information is necessary for us to process them. We can only give credit for this live session, but not the recorded versions, just so you know. This webinar is being recorded and it will be available for viewing later on on www.emeraldashborer.info. You will also find the recordings for all previous EAB University webinars there. I want to thank you for attending today and Don, you can take it away. Okay, um, I hope that you all can hear me. Uh, I thank everybody for tuning in today, and I uh, really look forward to telling this story because I'd like uh, the, as many people as possible to hear how this all came about, what I, what I found, and what we're doing uh, currently. So I, I uh, kind of like to start this talk, with, depending on the audience, with a reminder of what ash trees used to look like. So my first couple of slides, just uh, in case you're in areas with, that are missing these things these days, um, just tell you how nice of a tree and how valuable of a tree ash, ashes are. This slide is, a, is the uh, Virginia State Champion white, white ash tree. Um, most of you know this story about the life cycle of, of emerald ash borer, uh, which changed the whole game for ash trees out there in North America. So uh, if we just quickly uh, run through this life cycle, because characteristics here are used when you go out looking for it. So with the, you know, the adults emerge in late May through July, chew the characteristic D-shaped exit hole, come out, feed a little while on leaves, mate, and start to lay eggs, and then move through into the larval stage, which of course is a destructive stage of emerald ash borer, feeding on phloem, uh, cambium, and outer sapwood. And then um, through uh, uh, eight, uh, late fall and winter, they are in their pre-pupil phase. And then once it finally does warm up around here, um, They'll again move into pupation and reemerge as adults in May and June and July. So we, we also know well now the kinds of damage that this insect can wreak uh, because of the type of feeding that it does. Um, essentially girdles trees after a, a, a few years, susceptible trees that is. And so far all major ash trees in North America have proven to be susceptible to this insect. Of course, this insect is an Asian, non-native Asian insect. And uh, even healthy trees here in North America are killed within one to three years of their first symptoms, which contrasts with their native hosts, which tend to um, not die, especially if they're healthy, 
from emerald ash borer attack, uh, unless they're stressed in some way. And we now know that trees of basically all size can be colonized and killed by this beetle. We've all seen these sorts of scenes of the destruction the insect can wreak along streetscapes and golf courses and woodlots and natural forests and so forth. Um, the, when it's all over, billions of ash trees will be killed by this, by this insect with uh, billions in economic and ecological costs. This is the current range of emerald ash borer. Actually, it's not exactly current. We just learned a week ago that EAB was detected also in Louisiana. So this, this map is already out of date, but everything in, in red there are positive identifications of emerald ash borer. And um, of course, in the last year or so, it made some of these long distance jumps out to Colorado, down to Northern Georgia. And uh, according to predictions in some of the models of say 2009, 2010, emerald ash borer is already well beyond the boundaries it was expected to reach by say 2019. So it's, uh, you know, the, the situation was looking pretty dire for ash trees in North America for the most part, um, but at least we knew what to expect, right? Enter white fringe tree to the story. Uh, white fringe tree is a uh, small tree, multi-stem shrub in many cases, that is a native North American tree native to the southeastern US. Uh, it's also planted ornamentally and it's planted um, ornamentally more commonly also in the southeast and more in more scattered situations as you go farther north. Uh, this is a picture of one that was taken by my friend and colleague Dan Herms uh, at the campus of OARDC in Worcester, Ohio, showing you um, a, a, a white fringe tree in bloom. White fringe tree goes by many names. Um, if you look really close during the flowering season, you can see this face sometimes, but uh, it's commonly called Grancy Graybeard or Old Man's Beard, uh, especially down south. And, um, and you can see why. The name of white fringe tree comes from these fringe-like flower petals that are produced. Um, and then the other feature of the plant that's attractive and makes it uh, you know, useful ornamentally are these blue purple fruits that they produce in the fall. And uh, as evident by being a member of the Oleaceae, the olive family, these are very olive-like. And um, so these sorts of traits are why, what people like about white fringe tree and why it is planted ornamentally. Here's the native range of, of white fringe tree, excuse me, showing everything in green here, of course, is the uh, uh, reported native range of white fringe tree. It reaches its most abundance in, in the Southeast, Georgia, South Carolina, and so forth. It does uh, reach its Northern Northwestern limits in places like Southern Ohio, okay, where I've observed it, uh, a bit in Pennsylvania, Personally, I grew up in Pennsylvania and I, I had never heard of this tree before. I had never seen it in the wild. In fact, I never saw it until I moved to Ohio and found one in my backyard. And uh, I had to identify that tree. And, and, and once I did, I started to notice where other white fringe trees were planted in my area. And that's kind of uh, a basis for this study to some degree. But in any case, in a place like Ohio, Southern Ohio, where it reaches one of its northern limits, it's considered a, uh, it's a state listed species. It's considered potentially threatened at the moment. So it's fairly rare, but not rare enough that you can't find it. And I've been there and seen them now um, in the wild. And there's a picture of one from Shawnee State Forest. This is one of our, it's the largest state forest in Ohio, in uh, South Central Ohio, showing a wild white fringe tree in bloom. So why care about white fringe tree in regards to emerald ash borer? So as Robin mentioned, I had been working on emerald ash borer and ash interactions for 
pretty close to 10 years, focusing primarily on chemical determinants of resistance in resistant species, uh, but also looking at things like uh, oviposition preferences, egg physiology, um, volatile profiles, and so forth. And so, uh, but in the back of my mind all along has been the, the host range question about emerald ash borer. What we know it can attack ash. In Asia, it's been reported to attack other species in places like Japan and Korea. But we had not yet seen that happen in North America. And where would you look if you were interested in that question? And so what I'm showing here is a, a phylogeny showing the relatedness of different genera in the family Oleaceae. Okay, so every, uh, if you see the red circle, every name at that level is a genus. And uh, what I'm highlighting is where Fraxinus, the ash species, are located on this phylogeny and showing where white fringe tree is located, Keonanthus, on this phylogeny. And the way these phylogenetic trees work is that the, the closer, if, if you follow the, uh, the phylogenetic tree back, you can consider each of these lines a, a branch, you'll see that it's just one, um, one step away, Fraxinus is just one step away from a whole group of species there on the right hand side of this phylogenetic tree, um, meaning it's pretty closely related to those species. In fact, it's more closely related to those species than species that are more than one branch away. Those on the, on the left hat, uh, side, essentially. So actually I can control my, my pointer here. Um, so for example, people have been interested in regarding this host range question uh, with uh, lilacs and privet. Um, those are located here, two branches away from ash. For Scythia is another one that's been of interest. It's located um, several branches away from Fraxinus. Okay, but there's less attention been given to these species over here that are only, you know, basically a single step away in terms of uh, genetic relatedness to ash trees. So essentially, white fringe tree is the one of the closest relatives of ash trees in North America that is not an ash tree. Um, and it's also the closest uh, relative that emerald ash borer is, is potentially or has been interacting with in the last several years, okay? So what did we know about um, white fringe tree and buprested wood borers? So first of all, um, it's never been listed as a host to any buprested, and it's generally been considered relatively free of pests and diseases when you read the horticultural literature and so forth about white fringe tree. Um, now, when EAB was first discovered in North America, the, some of the very early studies were these examinations of what else it might eat other than ash trees in which it was found. And so the, the sorts of species that people care about, privet, lilac, um, uh, forsythia, walnut, hickory, and so forth were, were included in some of these early host range tests. These are mostly laboratory tests or common garden tests where you, uh, for example, offer adults leaves of these species because they have to eat leaves uh, as part of their maturation phase or to directly inoculate stems with the ova of EAB and see how well the larvae do in the, in the stems. So what was learned regarding white fringe tree at that time was that the adults would sample the leaves. They would eat the leaves to some extent in no choice tests in the laboratory. Okay. Um, and a number of species it had been found that the adults would feed on. Um, but basically when you place the uh, uh, eggs directly on the stems of relatives like Forsythia, Lilac, Privet, Walnut, Hickory, uh, larvae failed to develop uh, in, in any of those. They got through maybe an instar on a species like Privet, but failed to complete development or failed to progress beyond that stage. Interestingly, somehow 
white fringe tree was not examined at that level at that time. So ova were not placed on stems of white fringe tree at that time for some reason. I don't know if it was uh, availability or what. And what I say to audiences is, um, if it had been examined at that time, I probably would not be speaking with you today about this story. So that's what we knew going into the, the, uh, this year's events. All right, so as I described, I, I had a white fringe tree in my backyard and, I, and because I, I recognized that, I started to, to see others planted in, in my area. And I live in a town called Yellow Springs in the center of this uh, geographic region that I've identified here. And uh, I, I know that the local tree committee had planted a number of these trees around town. Um, eight in particular along a, a popular bike walking running bike trail that runs through town. But I also learned of a few others that were planted around town as well. And so given that this question was in the back of my mind about host range and uh, and white fringe tree of the uh, um, I finally decided that this past summer would be the time to investigate this systematically. So in contrast to maybe some of the things you might have heard about this find, this wasn't an accident. I wasn't just on a bike ride or a, or a Sunday walk. This was a study I was doing intentionally, systematically. Um, and it just happened to be a weekend in August that was the right time to do it. Okay, and I started again looking at these trees planted along a bike trail in, in Yellow Springs, Ohio. And I started at one end of the trail and proceeded through about three of those white fringe trees with no apparent uh, evidence of EAB attack and uh, came upon this tree. And again, what, what I was looking for were all the characteristics that you, that you look for in an ash tree that's attacked by EAB. Canopy weakening or canopy dieback, uh, obviously the presence of adult exit holes, bark splitting, epicormic sprouting, and, and so forth. All right, so I came upon this tree, and I think you can see uh, as well as I can what, it, what made me look closer at it. And when I did that, I saw that. And uh, right in front of my face, basically, about three feet or so above, above ground. I guess not exactly in front of my face. I'm six foot six inches tall. But uh, nonetheless, it was a pretty obvious, what I thought immediately was an EAB exit hole. And I thought, holy cow, there it is. This was about 30 minutes into my survey. And as I tell people, it really could have been anybody that found this. It just happened to be me because I went looking for it. Um, and knew what to look for, I suppose. What you can also see from this shot is on the right side is the bike trail. Um, and on the, on the right of that is a, a thousand acre nature preserve that's filled with, with white, green, and blue ash that have been under attack since about 2011, 2012. Um, on the left side is a street called Cory Street. And to the left of that is the village of Yellow Springs and also the campus of Antioch college which also had planted ash trees and there are some wild ash trees around that had been under attack as well so there are eab source populations uh, in the area now the ash trees were not all decimated by this point they are there's a mixture of availabilities from still relatively healthy ash to completely dead ash and regarding the blue ash that i mentioned they're still relatively unattacked in that forest there's some evidence of attack but uh, that's kind of another uh, separate question altogether. So there still was an ash resource around while these white fringe trees were starting to be targeted by EAB, which is one of the questions that has arisen. All right, so knowing that these trees were planted by uh, the Yellow Springs Tree Committee, after seeing this, I quickly contacted them and got permission to start to further investigate this tree, cut into it and so forth. So when I did that, um, just sort of confirmed that there was a characteristic serpentine gallery underneath that exit hole. And, uh, and again, that's deemed what I saw. 
And that exit hole, by the way, would have would have yielded an adult in the spring of 2014, meaning this gallery was was started in the summer of 2013. All right. So just to give you an idea of the the um, cohorts of larvae I've, I've seen to use this tree, this particular tree. All right. So further investigation of other parts of this tree revealed things like this picture. Um, what this, this would be is a gallery from the prior year. So this gallery would have been produced in 2012, likely yielding an adult in the spring of 2013. What it also does reveal is that as long as the tree is reasonably healthy, at least white fringe tree, it, it has a pretty good wound healing response. You can see this uh, essentially covering with, with uh, xylem that's, that's starting to occur over this wound. And if the tree failed to get further attack, it, it could have potentially have recovered from this. But that, as you'll see, it was not the case. All right, so I uh, then got permission to uh, cut the whole tree down and uh, take it back actually to my, my, my home about a mile away and start to peel bark from the majority of the tree and its branches. And when I did that, I started to see things like this. Of course, this is a live very happy emerald ash borer larva. Um, I, again, this is a point that got a little bit uh, misinterpreted or misreported in the stories that, that people might have seen, but I found at least 10 live larvae in this particular tree, and I didn't even completely investigate, didn't completely remove all the bark from this tree. I collected four of those larvae just so I you know, had some to further study if needed, but certainly my initial reaction upon seeing that larva, like most of you would have, is that that's an emerald ash borer larva. Okay, so I um, basically figured, yeah, I, I know what that is. This is a potentially big story. Thought I had a tiger by the tail, so to speak. And I went inside and over the next day, I wrote up a paper. Um, I basically, well, essentially I completed my survey of those eight trees I described along the bike trail and then went in the house and, and wrote up a paper in one day uh, for a for review as a rapid communication for the Journal of Economic Entomology. And I discussed with the editors the, the find and their willingness to review it and so forth. And so we, we went for it all on the basis of this one tree and this uh, this this potentially very important find. Um, and so, and that's where it's at for, for a bit, okay? About uh, five weeks later, I got the reviews back. And of course, during this period, I was out looking for additional evidence, and I'll get to that in a second. But when those reviews came back, uh, the, the reviewers agreed that, yes, this sounds like a very interesting story. Um, but uh, prove to us that that's an emerald ash borer, okay? And all I had at that time were larvae. And so I, I was also encouraged at that time, um, despite me figuring I knew what I was seeing, that it would be nice to have further confirmation from that, from say the USDA insect identifiers and so forth, more or less to get their stamp of approval. So I took that very larva that you're seeing there was then taken into the laboratory. Um, and on the left are uh, some of the high res photographs that we took under magnification of that larva. And that larva is, uh, uh, was likely a third instar EAB larva. And what I'm showing on the right is simply um, a, a figure a, a, from a paper published by Lourdes Chamorro and colleagues uh, that was all about the characteristic morphological features of emerald ash borer larvae, larvae. And as you can see, the larva there on the, on the left of that figure is a third instar. And um, it, the, the, the one that I recovered from white fringe tree very obviously matched pretty closely, especially when you look at these things like these bell-shaped abdominal segments. Um, the bifurcated pronotal groove on the back of the head and so forth. And uh, in any case, um, 
I, that very specimen you see on the left was then sent along first to a person at, in Michigan named James Zablotny. He's an insect identifier for USDA APHIS. And he uh, did his determination and then passed it along to Lourdes Shimoro, who now works for USDA ARS in uh, DC in the Systematic Entomology Laboratory, doing identifications and things like that of important insects here in, in North America. And at that point, both of them said, yes, that sure looks like an emerald ash borer. But again, to really get um, you know, your absolute positive identification, you can one, use molecular techniques, sequencing techniques, or find an adult. And the adult is, uh, will have features that will, will allow for a positive identification of the species. I hadn't yet had that. So until I had, that's just a picture then of the uh, close-up of the, 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 vent, uh, the dorsal surface of the head of that larva. So again, I didn't have an adult, but we had, the story was, was growing, all right? And uh, we're now in about two weeks after uh, that initial find. And this is still, again, when the paper was being reviewed, but when I was out looking for additional evidence. This one was found sort of by accident. I, I was riding my bike with this particular find. And as I rode by this house, which is a private residence in Yellow Springs, I saw this white fringe tree in her garden. And I think you can all see the same things I saw. Uh, on the left here, you see the, um, the, uh, this, this dead branch. And then you can see the, the, the sprouting from the branch. And even this branch on the right is, is weakened. And I quickly went and knocked on the door, got permission to take a close look at that. And there was an exit hole on one of those branches. Um, took some photos, and that would be the second tree then that I found with, with evidence of EAB attack. I've looked at this tree really closely just recently since I collected it for rearing purposes, and it has uh, several adult exit holes on it. Not all were apparent when I first looked at it, but certainly were apparent when you looked more closely at it. All right, and so during this period, I got lots of advice from people as I started to tell this story about where and, and get it, got advice about where white fringe trees could be found in the area. And I quickly, as soon as I could, went and took a look at those trees. So I learned of about five white fringe trees planted at Cox Arboretum in Dayton, Ohio. So this is a, a facility of the uh, Five Rivers Metro Park system in Dayton. And the first... Uh, two or three trees I examined, I could not find evidence of EAB attack, but then I walked up to this tree. This one was, during this initial survey, the largest white fringe tree that I had examined. So uh, there's no scale here, but this tree is about uh, 15 or 18 feet tall, about the same wide. And again, you can see the, the weakening in the branches in terms of the canopy thinning and lots of sprouting from the base of this tree. And so um, I got up close and personal with that tree and saw, again, the presence of adult exit holes on uh, a couple of branches. This is just one. Okay, so that became the third tree in this initial survey. And then finally, this is an interesting story. This, this day, we're now to October 8th, um, was a day when uh, my kids in town had a uh, a walk to school day with your parents sort of thing. And so I took the morning off and walked to school with, with them. And, and I met a fellow on the way who I was telling this story of, uh, uh, to, and he had some knowledge of plants and knew where some other white fringe trees were located in the area. So now he directed me to a cemetery called Ferncliff Cemetery and Arboretum in Springfield, Ohio, which is about 20 miles north of, of Yellow Spring, or excuse me, uh, 10 miles north of Yellow Springs. The uh, Cox Arboretum site, by the way, is about 20 miles uh, southwest of Yellow Springs. Okay, so that gives you an idea of the geographic spread here. So I visited Ferncliff that, that day then and uh, looked at um, about three white fringe trees while I was there. First couple looked to be uninfested. 
And then I looked at this one. This one took a little bit more uh, uh, investigation. I didn't find any adult exit holes, but and this is something you learn with white fringe tree is is to look for other symptoms if you can see where my arrow is just simply this swelling uh was indicative that there was something going on underneath that that spot and i've cut in i cut into this tree just enough to to reveal the presence of a of a mature gallery under that spot and i will soon be collecting this branch because i expect there to be a a, a, a pre-pupa in that stem that we will rear out as an adult as soon as it as soon as we warm it up all right so that was a great day so far found another tree that became the fourth tree in this initial survey that i found uh, to be infested if i go home and i was reminded that um Again, by that that insect identifier, James Zablotny, to, to, to you know, sometimes adults don't reemerge from the tree. If we really want to get a positive ID for this thing, go take a look to see if you can find a trapped adult in one of your infested trees. And at that point, I had only harvested and, and really heavily investigated one individual. But on that same day, then I decided, well, I took the day off. I'll go back and take a look at that 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 tree that I harvested from the bike trail. And so this is the base of that tree. Um, and of course, this is about six weeks after I initially collected it. Um, and, and it had dried during that period and started to crack, as you can see, the cracks developing, you know, in, the, in, the, uh, in this particular stem. Um, what you can also see here, where I'm highlighting, are evidences of, of lots of galleries that were in this tree some that were successful apparently and some that were not successful but essentially this tree aside from finding 10 live larvae and so forth was riddled with galleries some successful some not successful so i looked closer at one of these cracks and lo and behold as i've said in some stories it looked like this gleam of emerald light came back to my eyes and uh what indeed was was in in that tree was this a trapped adult and so if you look just above it this is the fairly well healed gallery okay that was produced by the larva that you know entered its pre-pupal chamber uh completed pupation into adult but failed to emerge for some reason now, i don't know why but it failed to emerge so i teased that thing out of the out of the out of the uh, log and uh, we did the same process of doing our high resolution photographs at right state and then sending it along to each of the USDA insect identifiers for their, their, um, their verdict. And so here's what that adult looked like. When I first pulled it out, to be honest, you see how violet it is. And um, for those who don't know, emerald ash borer has a number of color morphs from very emerald to violet as this one is to even copper bronze colored and so when i first pulled it out i failed to see the emerald and i it was only purple looking to me and i thought oh no maybe this is not emerald ash borer but uh under high resolution you can see the emerald scales uh present on the the uh the uh, wing covers when underneath the wings you see the metallic red red sheen which is characteristic of emerald ash borer adults. Even this uh, ridge that I'm pointing to um, is uh, characteristic. Its shape and the fact that it extends beyond the end of the abdomen are characteristic of adult emerald ash borers. And of course, you can see clearly the emerald coloration on the ventral side. I do want to point out that this adult was missing its head, which was just simply the result of my teasing it out of the log um either under my initial debarking of that part of the log or when i actually dug it out i'm not quite sure when it lost its head but the head is not necessary for the identification of the adult interestingly the real nail on the coffin is that you need to find a male and so um this specimen indeed proved to be a male 
And the reason you need a male is that characteristics of the genitalia are used for the positive identification. And uh, I, this is where the luck came in, both in finding it, but also that it turned out to be a male, so that we were able to nail down the positive identification as emerald ash borer. And this specimen was used to certify white fringe tree as a new host record by the Systematic Entomology Lab of USDA. Uh, <clears throat> really, the timing on this couldn't have been better. Um, <clears throat> I was scheduled to give a talk on this on April, uh, October 15th, two days later, to a, at an EAB research review meeting um, where USDA folks, other researchers on emerald ash borer, uh, talk about what they've been working on. Everybody saw my title, and so it, it was a kind of a high-pressure situation. And to have the positive ID come along right at this point was, was very timely. This, again, was also the time when the stories started to come out, the press releases started to be uh, uh, produced. So just to summarize, uh, this initial, <clears throat> um, the initial... Uh, survey here, which has now been published in the Journal of Economic Entomology with, with the additional evidence I described in the positive identification, the paper was accepted, and it came out in the first edition back in online on January 15th of 2015. As I've described, initially I found four of 20 white fringe trees, that's what's reported in the paper that I found with exit holes or galleries and so forth. I went back to one of the trees along the bike trail um, after this paper was in press and I found a gallery in one of those that I thought to be uninfested. So actually five of those first 20 showed evidence of attack. And again, the one debarked tree produced over 10 live larvae and a dead adult confirmed to be emerald ash borer. So that was the basis of the, the initial find. And the stories came out and came out and I gave interview after interview. I give various, these are just an example of some of the outlets. You probably, some of you probably heard about this story through some of these outlets. Um, I give the various sources credit for how they slightly tweaked the title and changed it just a little bit so it became their own. And of course, um, with each of these um, articles, there was often the, the details of the initial find, but then other people would were asked to comment on that. And so there were lots of questions that were raised during this period. And in some cases, people didn't know that, you know, the, the, uh, the, uh, the, that there had been a positive confirmation of the species. And, but other questions about why this happened arose. And so um, the, uh, you know, the questions about whether trees were stressed or that all the larvae were dead that I found and various sorts of kinds of uh, misinformation. So that's why I like to do these kinds of talks to, to uh, clarify all of that. Uh, at this point, I just simply want to say that the, the basic hypothesis about why this has happened is that white fringe tree simply shares enough in common chemically, either the volatile chemistry that attracts the adults and the phloem chemistry that is conducive to larval uh, feeding and growth shares enough of that with ash that emerald ash borer can make a living on white fringe tree. Um, at this point, I don't think that this is evidence that emerald ash borer has adapted to use white fringe tree. I think that white fringe tree probably has been within the range of acceptable hosts since it got here, but we haven't looked closely enough at white fringe tree until this year and that indeed EAB can find it. They will use it with some success. And again, I, a number of trees I've looked at, the majority I've looked at have not been infested yet. So we don't yet know the extent of this, but that's the basic hypothesis about why they're using white fringe tree. But questions came up about whether tree stress and the fact that there was a regional drought um, in 2012 in this part of Ohio and the part of this part of the Midwest could have been responsible for, for this EAB using these trees. So over the holidays, I was sort of just perusing the internet for pictures and happened to notice that the Google Earth images of Yellow Springs, Ohio 
were, were produced and published in July of 2012 at the kind of height of the regional drought that we had in this area. So again, I live here. I was not looking at white fringe trees very closely during that time period, but it was interesting that through Google Earth, I can look at the white fringe trees I looked at in 2014 during the year that they were supposedly under severe drought. If you look at this picture, I think, uh, which is taken in July, I think you'll see that this tree was not particularly drought stressed. Um, and the grasses and trees are all in pretty good shape at this time. It's always fairly dry in July anyhow, but these trees were not, in my opinion, overly drought stressed. And moreover, they were not drought stressed the year before, nor the two years after this. So I do not believe that the drought that occurred in 2012 is in any way responsible for this find. It may have a role in making trees more attractive than they would be otherwise, but I do not think it was necessary for these trees to be attacked. All right, so interestingly, when you look at this tree, by the way, this is the one I found to be infested in that initial survey. This branch was missing um, by the time I looked at this tree. And the tree committee confirmed that that branch died and they removed it at some point in the last couple of years. I now suspect it died because of emerald ash borer and that's why they removed it. But nobody really noticed at the time. All right. So now um, in late October, so up to that point, it had really been me uh, doing most of this survey on my own with, again, some assistance on finding trees from, from various folks, very important folks along the way. But up to that point, it was really me and a couple of insect identifiers and the reviewers of the paper who formally knew about this story. I suppose that raised some suspicion, but by, by around Halloween, I got a phone call from Joe Boggs, who's an extension agent in Ohio, that uh, it appeared that students in a, in a plant identification class of Steve Foltz, who is at the um, Cincinnati Zoo and Arboretum, uh, believe they found uh, uh, adult exit holes on white fringe tree at a place called Spring Grove Cemetery and Arboretum in Cincinnati, Ohio. And I've got to say, when I got that phone call, it was a great relief. Not that there was more evidence that white fringe tree was being attacked, but that somebody else saw it too. So what that really did then is launch a whole set, a whole uh, new study, um, basically starting in, in late October through November that's continuing um, at present. So let me run you through what that was all about. So for those of you who never heard of Spring Grove Cemetery and Arboretum, this is a historic cemetery in Cincinnati. It's a really beautiful site, um, uh, kind of a semi-naturalistic setting, lots of Gothic architecture. A, it's, a, it's on the National Historic Register. Um, and it's also a very large uh, uh, site as well. There are lots of important people that are buried there. So this is the... Um, grave marker of, of Barney Kroger, who founded the Kroger chain of grocery stores. But there are also um, lots of other famous folks and Civil War heroes and so forth. So it's a, it's a quite interesting and impressive place. It's large. It's about 733 acres, which incidentally makes it the second largest cemetery in, in the U.S., which was a surprise to me. It's also an arboretum though, and they take, that's a very point of pride with this uh, site. There are about uh, 1,200 plant species and about 1,000 of those are actually labeled. So you can literally walk up to everything you're seeing and, and know what it is just by looking at the label. It became very useful for this story because it has lots of fringe trees planted, that have been planted historically there. Um, about 28 were there at the at the start of this survey, for example. It's also useful because um, it has a relative of white fringe tree planted there as well, Chinese fringe tree, which is from the home range of emerald ash borer and is also planted ornamentally. And again, some of the questions that arose in this after the initial discovery was, 
What about Chinese fringe tree, this other tree that's in the horticultural plant trade? These trees were of mixed ages, sizes, and management histories. So some of these white fringe trees were likely 100 years old, and some were only 15 years old. And some had been pruned at certain points and, and just kind of taken care of. None had been treated with pesticides in, in the recent past, uh, as far as we know. Another thing that I tacked on to this survey that I did for emerald ash borer was to examine also for the presence of lilac borer attack. This is a native borer, again, that will attack ash and relatives that, again, will not necessarily kill trees or shrubs, but can weaken them. And uh, when the tree or shrub is stressed for other reasons, it can degrade the health of those things. White fringe tree was mentioned as a host to this borer in the past, but not thought to be particularly susceptible. I knew it was there, and I thought I would include that in surveys as well. So what I did is these trees were distributed fairly randomly around that map that you see on your right, and just did the same sort of survey for evidence of attack that I did in my initial study. This gives you an idea of some of the, the sizes of white fringe trees there, which were in many cases larger than the ones I looked at in my initial survey, partly because they were just older. And I also want to acknowledge a couple of guys, Brian Hines on the left, Dave Gressley on the right, who are on the horticultural staff of Spring Grove, who've been very helpful in this process. This tree, by the way, turned out to be uh, uninfested as far as we can tell uh, by EAB. And again, here's Chinese fringe tree, just giving you an idea of its appearance. Chinese, fr Chinese fringe tree has similar kinds of flowers, a little bit smaller than white fringe tree, but it's more often um, grown as a tree-like specimen rather than a multi-stem shrub uh, or tree that like white fringe tree. Although I have seen them being multi-stemmed as well. But in any case, here's a more tree-like Chinese fringe tree. And these pictures were taken now in uh, late October, around October 30th. So I did the same sort of survey for evidence that I did looking for adult exit holes that you can see. So every tree uh, that I would see an adult exit hole, I peeled a bit of bark just to confirm that there were indeed uh, EAB uh, characteristic serpentine galleries under those sites. And just went and investigated every white fringe tree and every Chinese, fr uh, Chinese uh, fringe tree that was present in, in the site. I point out this one, um, which is interesting. It's one of these large, pretty nice specimens of, of white fringe tree. And at the base of this one, there is a marker on it. it says it's the state champion white fringe tree. And as, as most of you know, you, you uh, can take various kinds of measurements on size and health of, a, of an individual species and enter it into a competition to, to be a registered as the state champion. So Spring Grove contains the, um, the state champion white fringe tree for the state of Ohio. Unfortunately, that state champion has a, at least one stem on it with several adult exit holes from EAB on it. These are two Upon reinvestigation, there are many more than that on the state champion white fringe tree, which is disappointing. Here's, here's another large white fringe tree I examined during that survey, and it was basically the largest I examined. It, the basal diameter here is about two feet in diameter, and this tree is about 20 feet tall. This tree is probably on the order of 100 years old, for example. All right, I point this one out not only because of its size, but when you uh, when I was investigating a, a dead branch on that uh, tree, you can see again the healed over uh, calloused gallery. And this thing right here in the middle that I basically cut through, and you might guess what that was. That was an adult that also failed to emerge. This stem was more uh, degraded by fungi and things, but again, when you look closely under high resolution, you can see that this individual was also an emerald ash borer adult, failed to emerge from that stem for whatever reason. And again, it's more characteristic of the emerald morphology 
of emerald ash borer. It's purely green, basically. And again, uh, Lorda Shimoro, the insect identifier for USDA uh, ARS, also agreed that this was emerald ash borer. So just in, to summarize that survey, which uh, continued throughout uh, late fall and even into January, nine of the 28 white fringe trees I examined there had one or more EAB exit holes and all confirmed to have galleries. 19 of the 28 white fringe trees also had lilac borer attack. So they, lilac borer were, was using white fringe tree pretty commonly, or uses it probably more commonly than anybody has recognized. Eight of the nine white fringe trees with EAB attack also had lilac borer attack, which is perhaps not surprising given how widely they used the white fringe tree. I recovered a dead adult EAB from one of those like I did in the initial survey. And importantly, so far, it looks like Chinese fringe trees are relatively immune from attack from both of these species, EAB and lilac borer. I saw no evidence that they could use it. That is data that is currently in preparation for submission, and so this stuff has not yet been, been sent out, although I've been talking about it in talks like this. All right, so now uh, along the way, you know, from the initial survey through that second survey, lots of questions have arisen about uh, what to do next or what we would like to know next. And one of those is the, the rate of adult emergence from infested stems. Um, the second question about sequence comparisons, initially we thought we'd, we would need to use sequencing to identify what I had found. And it turns out that we did not need to use that because we could do it morphologically. But we still are sequencing those uh, some of those specimens to see if we can find any variation at all in the EAB larvae that use white fringe tree versus those that may use ash, for example, to see if there is any evidence of strains developing. We'd like to know the comparative growth and success of EAB and fringe tree relative to ash and also the chemical determinants of susceptibility. You know, what, what makes white fringe tree acceptable and other relatives not acceptable, apparently. What's the long-term risk here? Will these trees die from attack uh, of both wild and cultivated fringe trees and relatives? And how might trees be protected is, is a question, especially given that these trees have flowers that are visited by pollinators and fruits that are eaten by birds and wildlife and so forth. What are the role of environmental factors like water availability in susceptibility? As I mentioned, I do not believe that drought was necessary to make this happen. It could have made the trees more attractive in that particular year. But I, I think I failed to mention that I found evidence of galleries in that initial white fringe tree from 2011. So they were attacking this tree even before that drought showed up. Um, but nonetheless, we would like to know what the role of stress is in susceptibility of fringe trees to EAB. Next, what are the volatile cues adults use to find it? We presume that it, it over, they overlap with what ash produces and that's the, that, that adults recognize, but we don't know that yet. And then finally, adult mating and feeding behavior on the plant. We know from lab tests that adults will um, feed on leaves a bit, but we don't know if they meet on the plant to, to mate and, and so forth. So we'd like to know some of those questions. Some of these things are underway. These are stems in rearing barrels from that spring grove study of white fringe tree, putatively infested that we, um, in a couple of weeks now, we, we hope to see or expect to see some adults emerging from these logs. So these logs are in a laboratory facility of the USDA APHIS in Bethel, Ohio. And this part of the project is being assisted by uh, Vanessa Lopez and Ann Ray who are, who are located at Xavier University. We are also doing some of the direct tests of larval performance on stems of white fringe tree and Chinese fringe tree and some other relatives. And this is occurring in my lab right now, uh, direct tests of how well larvae do when you place the eggs directly on the stem. So assuming that an adult will place an egg on the stem, 
can the larvae survive? Can they grow and, re and, and complete development? So this is underway right now. Also underway is that we've, I've marked uh, wild white fringe trees in southern Ohio to follow through time to see how they fare as the wave of EAB moves through this part of Ohio. So EAB is just getting into southern Ohio. This is a fellow, Kevin Bradbury, who helped me identify and find and mark uh, white fringe trees back in the fall. And we will continue to find additional trees, mark and monitor them through time to see what happens. I do want to finish with just a few slides on this question, which again is one of the immediate things that came up after the initial find. What might be next on the menu? If you just refer back to that phylogeny, I indicated that what I'm most concerned about next are those things over here on the right. Everything that I'm circling with this arrow right now is more closely related to white fringe tree than white fringe tree is to ash. So if white fringe tree can be attacked by EAB, these uh, species over here, these genera, may also be vulnerable maybe more vulnerable from than the things that we've been concerned about like lilac and privet and forsythia in the past. And so let me just show you a few of those. One is pygmy fringe tree, which is in the same genus. It's also a North American native. It's a federally endangered plant restricted to a few areas in, in, in central Florida, the Sand Hills region of Florida. And, uh, if white fringe tree can be attacked, there's concern. I have concern that this federally endangered tree can be attacked as well. Now it's called pygmy fringe tree because it's small. It looks like a small version of white fringe tree. But it does reach sizes large enough, I think, to be attacked. On the left is a about a two inch diameter pygmy fringe tree stem. On the right is a one and a half inch diameter white fringe tree stem that was attacked by EAB. I have in front of me that you can't see a stem of white fringe tree that I collected from a tree that's three quarters of an inch in diameter that yielded an adult EAB from it, as evidenced by an exit hole and mature gallery. So this tree is likely vulnerable and it does touch overlap distributions with white fringe tree. Devil wood is another southeastern species. Um, that looks a lot like white fringe tree, and it's also used ornamentally. And there are a few of these in that Spring Grove site. I've looked at them, and I can't confirm that EAB has attacked them yet, but we are looking at Devilwood as well. Lump privet is another one. It's not used in the ornamental plant industry, but it's a wild relative, pretty close relative of white fringe tree in the southeast and in the deep south. Um, that's not really that closely related to privet. That's just part of its common name. The genus is Forestiera. So that's of interest as well. And you can see the shared characteristics here in terms of the olive-like fruits and the leaves and so forth. And then finally, this species, cultivated olive. Again, this is not a native North American species, but it is grown ornamentally to some extent in the Southeastern US. There's a fledgling commercial industry in Florida of course, it's in California. EAB will get to California. Cultivated olive is, is certainly something uh, to, be, to be examined in the near future. And with that, I simply want to thank you all for um, listening and to acknowledge um, lots of people who've helped me find trees, provide access to trees, provide identification services, and, and other sorts of support. And with that, I will conclude my part and would be happy to start to answer questions. Thank you so much, Dan. It, it, this has been pretty fascinating. Um, let me bring up a couple questions here for you. One that we have from Rachel is, do you think there are any influence to those trees being in the Northern range as far as on being attacked by EAB? Is that a question about whether trees in the northern part are can be attacked? If if that is the case, um, 
I can say that uh, in the last, just the last couple of weeks, I, well, just yesterday, I found a picture or saw a picture of uh, an apparently uh, adult exit hole of EAB from a white fringe tree taken in Chicago. And I also have now learned of uh, some trees in Michigan outside of Detroit that look like they are white fringe trees, that is, that look like they are, have been attacked by EAB, but that's yet to be confirmed. And so what I've been saying is that the more people uh, uh, look for this, um, I think the more it will be found. And I don't think that northern trees will be more susceptible than southern trees. Um, but, uh, you know, there are fewer of them in the north, and that's why it's taken this long to see this. And so that's right, kind of my you. response to that um, one. Sean Walker asks, is this the kind of phenomenon that will influence the rate or pace of a pulse or wave of EAB passing through a region, i.e. can we assume it will take longer for available EAB hosts to be exhausted in a particular region? That's a great question and I would generally agree with that. Um, where white fringe tree is abundant, it, it is an, a, a now uh, apparently acceptable alternative host for emerald ash borer. It also seems to have a pretty strong wound response. And as long as it's reasonably healthy, um, it seems to be able to tolerate attack for quite a while. Although I do think that they will be killed. Certainly branches get killed and even the entire trees end up getting heavily weakened from my uh, uh, observations so far, but they, this tree will perhaps sustain the presence of EAB in the landscape for longer than if it wasn't there. Um, so um, I do know, for example, that, or I'm suspecting again that that initial tree I found to be infested was probably starting to be attacked in about 2011. And that's the same year that in this particular town, Yellow Springs, when ash trees were being attacked. So they were finding that tree as soon as they were finding ash trees. And uh, I do suspect that this could contribute to keeping EAB out there for longer than it uh, uh, otherwise. Okay, um, we have another one here. Uh, Greg says, not sure if I missed this, but do you have any initial thoughts as to why Chinese fringe tree appears to be resistant to EAB? And he says, maybe in virtue of prolonged coevolution. Yes, again, great question and great uh, hypothesis. And that is our leading hypothesis at the moment. This has not yet been thoroughly investigated, but if you look at the uh, interaction of EAB with ash species, we know that uh, Asian ash species, like Manchurian ash, for example, are more resistant than our North American ash species are. Not only more resistant, they're even uh, less attractive for ov oviposition in the first place. And that could be as a result of their coevolution with EAB and their ability to, um, to uh, deter it or resist attack if they do get attacked. And Chinese fringe tree could be in the same boat. It does have an overlapping distribution with emerald ash borer in China. And again, we there's nothing at all in the literature at all about Chinese fringe tree and emerald ash borer that I can find. But we suspect that it it likely is resistant on the basis of its its uh, you know its long history with with emerald ash borer. But that's it, uh, just a hypothesis at the moment, but a reasonable one. All right, thank you. Um, Rachel, I think she's uh, she may be trying to clarify her question, but it just says, in terms of susceptibility, are the northernmost trees perhaps more vulnerable versus those in the southeast? Um, more vulnerable perhaps because they're out of their uh, growing conditions that they prefer and are more stressed. Um, I certainly don't know the answer to that yet. Um, their white fringe tree is pretty interesting. It has, the, again, that southeastern distribution I mentioned, but it does grow reasonably well north of there, outside of that range, even to large sizes. And so um, I, I'm not 
I don't know what to say about that at this moment. I don't know how to compare. I, I suspect that southern trees will be susceptible as well as northern trees. Okay. Um, one, we have another question. As a landscaper managing fringe tree, it was not uncommon to see stem dieback pre-EAB. Management was much like lilacs as regular, regular removal of older stems. Are you examining collected data on the stem girdling fungal cankers, et cetera, that are part of the usual suspects for stem loss? Uh, no, I haven't collected any data on on other sources of mortality in white fringe tree. Um, the trees I've examined don't show ev evidence of any of that sort of disease at all. Um, again, the other thing that they do show is lilac borer attack. And again, that could have some kind of synergistic uh, interaction with EAB as well if lilac borer basically weakens the tree and that makes the trees more attractive to EAB. But I also have seen EAB attack on white fringe trees that look otherwise have been healthy, not diseased or without lilac borer attack. So um, I do want to address, though, the idea about whether management could in include just rejuvenation pruning and comment on the fact that white fringe tree is a strong root sprouter or stump sprouter. Um, and yes, it, it, it can potentially be managed by cutting stems back to the ground and letting them sprout back. However, we are seeing that quite small stems can be attacked by EAB. So that's not a, that's not going to protect the tree in the long term. You know, we have half inch, three quarter inch stems of white fringe tree that, and even ash trees that, that can be attacked by EAB. So that, um, that wouldn't protect them indefinitely. All right, thank you. Um, Clara has a question, but just before we get to hers, I wanted to respond to Dan, to Dawn Holzer's question. Has APHIS added fringe tree to its list of regulated items? I can. I have talked with folks at APHIS just a few days ago, and they said, no, not yet. They are still doing some investigation on this uh, phenomenon with EAB and white fringe tree, and until they get done with that, um, that so far, that is fringe tree is not a regulated item. Now, Clara, she asks, is there any research underway to compare the resistance in Chinese fringe tree to the resistance in Chinese ash in hopes of finding some resistant gene? Well, the, that's a great question. And those are the sorts of things that we've been working on in the ash system to try to with with collaborators to identify resistance mechanisms and the genes that underlie those mechanisms in, in ash trees. Um, the, this new find regarding white fringe tree and the rel apparent uh, resistance of Chinese fringe tree um, leads naturally to the search in that tree as well. And what I can say is that we are seeking funding for that to, to address those sorts of questions. Nothing I'd say is, is formally underway at the moment, because that's, that's all about uh, the money sometimes. You know, pending, <laughs> pending funding. Regarding, I have another question regarding support of EAB life cycle. Is yeah. there any evidence that females achieve maturational feeding on on the foliage of the white fringe tree? This resource only mentions challenging males and leaves out the details. And that is uh, from the host range information that we have on the emerald dashboard.info site. Um, I, if, if it doesn't talk about it on the, the, eab.info site. I don't know if there are, is other in, um, research going on as far as challenging just males and possibly you do then, Don. Um, after that, that initial study that I described that was not even published in the peer review literature, it was just simply a technical report of uh, the study being described at like EAB research review meetings and so forth. Um, that's the only work that was done on white fringe tree and EAB. So we, this is all brand new folks. Um, so if females were not used at that time, they have never been used. Uh, that's something that we certainly can uh, try to address in upcoming studies. I would say though that it's reasonable to expect that if males could could mature on leaves of uh, 
white fringe tree that females can as well. And moreover, it, it um, you know, they fly around, so it may not even meet, be necessary for adults to be able to mature on white fringe tree foliage for the larvae to be able to use the tree successfully if they mature on, on ash foliage and fly over to a white fringe tree. So um, that's a great question. We don't know the answer yet, and but it may, um, it may not All be right. that important. Uh, we have a question here. Do you think we would be more likely to find EAB in white fringe tree in older, more heavily infested areas versus newly discovered populations of EAB that have lower population, or yeah, that have lower populations of EAB. I, I would say yes. And the reason, there are two reasons for that. Um, well, one, you need to have EAB around for them to, to attack the tree. And the, and the more EAB there are around, the more likely you'll you'll get attack, um, just pro, just a simple proportion. Um, the uh, now I I don't well I, just in relation to the the native range of white fringe tree and the distribution of where emerald ash borer is, you can see that emerald ash borer is just now really pushing into the uh, the, the 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 range of white fringe tree where it's more abundant. And so what I tell people is the reason I found this this year and this, this has been discovered is I just happen to be in an area, Southern Ohio, where this tree is planted in reasonable enough abundance that there were enough to really take a look at. And EAB has been through here for a good you know, five years now uh, in my areas um, that, that you can see it if you look for it. And so, um, I expect that as EAB moves into the southeast, becomes more abundant, that we will see it on white fringe tree, um, you know, there in, in proportion to how many okay. EAB are there. Um, those are all the questions that we have had so far. Um, I did want to mention that if you have questions about your CEUs that you need, um, I've typed Amy Stone's email address in the notes uh, pod at the bottom of the screen on the left if you have any uh, questions. Um, Don, this has been great information. It's probably caught up a lot of people on what's going on. I, and I agree with you, there's been a lot of media that have had all kinds of uh, uh, stories on it. And some of it's a little bit right and some of it's a little bit not. And so it's good that you've <laughs> clarified a lot of the information. This is very much appreciated and I hope you'll come right. back later when you've got another update and we can uh, give people uh, uh, you know some more new information as as what you have uh, found oh email Don let's let's can we put your email in the in the notes pad down here um, okay um yeah absolutely I um, yes I want to encourage anybody who does happen to find, if they look hard enough, a uh, white fringe tree with attack by EAB, I'd love to know about it. And I just wanted to comment on what Robin had mentioned about APHIS and their decisions about this tree. Um, I am working with APHIS um, currently. You know, the APHIS is, is uh, we, we have the stems of trees in one of APHIS's facilities right now. So when, when APHIS says they're working on it, that's partly me underneath that as well, just so people know that. If you give it to me, um, I, I can type it in. My email, talking. how should I enter that, Robin? Okay, so my email is simple. It is don.cipollini at write.edu. And I'd be happy to you know follow this up with any questions and-, and All right. Uh, comments and so forth that. in that way. If you can see it down there, any any other questions really quickly, folks? I'm going to try to wrap this up at uh, uh, 15 past the hour, and we've got about another minute or so. If you have anything else, quickly type it in. If not, um, there's Don's email address, and you should be able to contact him. But I really appreciate this. We've had a great group, and I'm I'm really happy that we were able to get this webinar going and have Don on here to talk. So thank you so much, sir.
Thank you very much. And all thanks right, I'm going to all close you up the in. meeting here, and uh, hopefully, you will all have a nice, warm afternoon. <laughs> Thank you very much.